Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. We're so excited to chat with our guests tonight. And as you know, with our new format, we're just going to jump right in. We are here. Just had to hit my live stream button. We're here live streaming with Master Stephen Hayes, the legendary ninja Stephen Hayes. And Master, I just want to, I actually had a bunch of questions written down, but we started talking about one right before the show that I think is as or more interesting than anything I had. I'd love for you to tell us three or four truths about ninjas. And I'd love for you to tell us three or four things that everybody gets wrong because of the mythology. Hmm. Well, now we're going way back in history now, not current age. You know, way back in history, I think, you know, there were some movies that came out in the 80s and in America and uh, some movies that came out in the 60s in Japan that presented some things that, you know, maybe were not quite true. So I think number one is that uh, the ninja was a dedicated uh, practitioner of this spying and sabotaging. And, uh, you know, you could hire these ninja. Not really the truth. The ninja lived in this Iga and Shiga area of Japan. And way before there was a war and one side lost the war and they retreated to the mountains and became what we call the ninja. But the ninja saw themselves as, you know, the rightful rulers of their territory. You know, my grandfather is buried on this mountain and, uh, you know, I need to uh, run this. Uh, I need to govern this. So that would be number one thing. Um, you know, a ninja wasn't necessarily a guy in a black suit sneaking around, uh, just waiting to be hired. Um, uh, and that brings up the second uh, stereotypical ninja thing, uh, you know, this idea of a black suit. I mean, I wear a black suit today, but it's a karate suit. Um, I do have a ninja suit that Century Martial Arts sells. Uh, I designed it 40 years after the ninja boom, you know, so, uh, uh, but it is available. But, you know, the idea that a ninja would probably wear clothing that just didn't draw any attention. So, you know, like workers clothes or uh, some low level samurai where they just blend in. It's what I call today the uh, kind of a gray, maintenance worker mm -hmm. so, you know you see a guy with a tool belt on and gray shirt and pants uh just walking around uh, nobody thinks anything about it oh he's here to fix the air conditioner i guess uh, nobody even sees him and uh so that would be a second uh you know popular myth about the ninja that you know was allowed to be elaborated in the movies and i mean even in my first books I was challenged, you know, I'm going to introduce the ninja. Do we go with the kind of the stereotype um, ideas or do we go in with an iconoclastic? No, this isn't true. This isn't true. I just thought that would confuse the heck out of people. So I went with the stereotype. We have black suits in the books. Uh, we talked about the spying, the sabotage and so forth. Uh, that was you know, just w was the way the art was introduced uh, in the 1980s. And a third myth, this would be how the ninja were organized. Um, I think a lot, maybe even a lot of situations, people wouldn't even know they were working for the ninja. Mm. Uh, you know, so somebody has a cousin who's the tea preparer in the kitchen you know uh of a castle that we're gonna consider invading well so i'll ask my cousin you know see what she knows oh well we have to make a lot more tea because we have a lot more soldiers here all of a sudden or uh you know this kind of thing you know, the person had no idea that he or she was uh in effect a, a ninja providing intelligence uh 
and uh, you know, it's so subtle, so mm. subtle. Because if they caught somebody, hey, you're a ninja. Oh my God! That, I mean, just grisly torture, grisly torture. Uh, and uh, if a person didn't know anything, well, you know, they'd be tortured to death, but they wouldn't be able to reveal anything. So they were very careful how they set up these networks. So maybe those are three popular myths that uh, may not uh, may not actually be true. I just want to touch on those in reverse order, and then I want to throw it to a question Hanchi had before the cameras were rolling. But so for the last two, you're almost it's almost like you're suggesting that like watching a modern day CIA thriller the way they hire that nondescript looking person who quietly gets information from someone at the bar or at the thing, that it's almost a, a forerunner of that type of espionage. Would that be inaccurate? No, I think that's very accurate. Very accurate. Little bit of information, little bit of information. Ah, but the head guy gets a little bit here and a little bit there, a little bit, then he has to be able to figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, I remember, yeah. I remember the first time I met uh, the Dalai Lama. This was like in 1986, and uh, he doesn't live in Tibet anymore. The Chinese invaded, and uh, he escaped. But he was asking. I I had been to Tibet. Last time he was in Tibet was 1959, so I'd been to Tibet uh, 25 years later. But he was asking me, you know, these questions like, did the uniforms fit? the Chinese soldiers, you know, uh, which direction were the trucks going most of the time? Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't necessarily understand what my answers were providing to him, but he knew what he was asking. And uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So something like that, something like that. That's amazing. And then the first thing, you know, just again, to, for clarity is that these weren't just hired assassins or hired guns. Many of them had vested interest in their land and protecting their heritage in a, in a more conventional way, almost like, like anybody in a fiefdom or, or an area would. Oh yeah. And I think, uh, you know, we can draw parallels to this day, you know, uh, Russia, wants to own Ukraine and Ukraine's saying, no, we run Ukraine. And uh, Russia's saying, yeah, but you were originally part of us. And they said, well, that was when the Soviets ran everything. And before that, it, who's right? Who's right? You know, we're just going back and forth, but that the personal motivation is no, we are Ukraine. We want to run Ukraine. Um, and uh, so the same thing, same thing would have mm -hmm. happened back in uh you know 1500s japan right on um hanchi legacy i know you had some questions about uh, the ninja's methods of escape if they were captured or that kind of thing that was a bit more physical but uh my question here is on listening and what it did touch on before was so sometimes the ninjas didn't even know who they were even if they were working with each other like you may have had that guy in the bar and then somebody somewhere else doing something, but the person who was employing the ninjas or sort of will, for lack of better words, the leader of the ninjas, he'd be the only guy who would get the full map, the full idea, right? So that's a way of um, keeping himself safe and not really being, uh, say if they caught somebody and they tortured them, so they wouldn't be able to really discover who the whole network was. Am I right in assuming that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, really gets tricky. So the head guy would talk to one of his people. He'd say, look, you're the only one here I can count on. Uh, can you organize a team? Your job in the next three months is going to be to move in and you know see what you can find out. And uh, hey, but you got to remember, um, you may run into other people who claim they're working for me, but uh, be careful, be careful. They could be liars. Uh, you're the one I'm entrusting. And he tells that to four different people. 
Yeah. So they have no idea. Maybe, so you, yeah. yeah, you send four teams in to get this done. One team might be eliminated. They may be killed. Okay, we still got three. Uh, one team might be, uh, you know, a double agent. So, oh, we know what he wants, but we're going to, so they go in and they don't do it. Well, we got two that are still trying to get it done. Um, and if they did run into each other, uh, oh, the boss warned us there'd be other people claiming to be working for him. And uh, uh, so they would not even relate to each other. Uh, I mean, that's the way you'd have to think at that level, you know, because somebody's going to be betray you. They're going to offer them some money or they'll offer them girls or they'll offer to uh, make them, you know, some high position or uh, whatever it takes to buy somebody's allegiance away from the uh, original person. We just know that. We just know that there's some people that are motivated by those things. And so you got to pad uh, your uh, operation. And uh, the head guy had to know this. You can't just trust somebody at their word. Um, Master Hayes, you know, this show is about you, but you have such a unique expertise on something we haven't really gotten into in our episodes. So I want to ask one more really specific ninja question. It's as much for me which is, you know, we know why Kung Fu blew up because of Bruce Lee. And we know in the 80s, later in the 80s with Jean-Claude, you know, that gave us the karate kickboxing or you had your Seagal with your Aikido. What do you attribute that early 80s ninja explosion to where every fourth movie was about ninjas? It was an exciting time for movies for a young guy like me. And there, the other ones had the movie star identified with them. But what do you think that explosion of ninja movies was about when there wasn't a single identifiable martial artists we were looking at in them uh well we could say i screwed up <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm the only guy <laughs> who went to japan and studied that and 40 years ago i had a dark beard and hair you know uh, i was you know, not always this grandpa looking guy, you know, and I had this martial art that nobody had ever seen before. Uh, I was eloquent. Um, and actually, I'd studied acting in college. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But somehow, you know, karmically, I, I just was not supposed to be in the movies. Yeah. So they got uh, Sho Kosugi, who I like. I like. I, you know, we still send emails back and forth to each other. He's got some projects he's working on still. I like Sho. But, you know, he was a karate uh, practitioner and uh, uh, was married to a Chinese woman. And he was very successful. But how he was successful is he would buy up, like, apartment buildings. So he was a real estate investor. And uh, I don't know how this uh, Menachem Golem, you know, head of Canon Films, I don't know how they made that connection. I never asked show, uh, but he became like the ninja guy in mm -hmm. all of these movies, but he wasn't a ninja. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so the movies were playing up on this little bit tiny bit of research what were the sick because in the 1960s there was like a ninja boom they had these ninja movies in japan so uh, some people watch those but a lot of them you know they they would get karate people and say well you're gonna fight like a ninja so just do your karate but do it faster and meaner <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Ninjutsu has its own actual way to move and so forth. And uh, but that was never seen on any of those movies. And uh, so the second part of that question is what grabbed people, you know, without a Jean-Claude Van Damme or a Seagal or, uh, um, you know, what captured people? And, you know, I've thought about this a lot. You know, in the 80s, it was politically very different from today. You know, very different. Um, 
And uh, culturally, it was very different. You know, and you think back on it, it's like three generations ago. I know that because I, my wife and I got married in 1980. We had children and those girls are now in their like pushing 40 and they have kids that are Mm -hmm. 10. That's three generations ago. And uh, culture changes pretty rapidly and uh, even more so in recent years with, uh, you know, this onslaught of social media and uh, uh, the culture changes, values change, things that you're not allowed to talk about now. People talked about in the 80s. And uh, um, so maybe there was something about uh, this lone individual who was unknown, unknown, masked individual moving with the moon at night. Uh, We tried everything. Uh, We could legally to get stuff done, but the law got in the way. You know, I mean, you can think about the popularity of, uh, about similar Godfather films. You know, hey, and these guys are criminals. They they just kill people. Yeah, but you know, uh, the system was corrupt. Yeah, uh, you know, the government people were corrupt, and so they just said, "Hey, if that's the game, we can play that too." So, you know, there's some sympathy for the mafia people uh, and uh, the Corleone family, and. Uh, so I think some of that carried over to this popularity. I love that. And you touched on the Cold War, you know, with Russia and the States. And I think the idea that you've got these massive superpowers, but that an individual would actually have some power in that through espionage or whatever, as opposed to these big uh, faceless bodies. Um, let's go around the horn on this before we go to our introductions. Um, Sensei Dofa, and then we'll go Sensei Suido and Sensei Legacy. What? What are the appeal like? What appealed to you? I mean, this the word ninja is shrouded in fantasy and mystery. What what is it that makes you go? Oh, that's that's something I want to know about. Well, I can only speak for me. I've, you know, if that's the line, I've always been the guy who is like bouncing just below the line and then on the line and then just below the line and then on the line. And I like to think of the, I like to romanticize the ninjas as that right? The people who are like, they're not like, you know, those terrible people that need to be locked away forever. Like they're actually just kind of bouncing under there. And the thing that appeals to me also, Sean, is they're martial artists, right? So they're using that martial arts skill. So they're, you got to also put Kota Bushido and all those things that applies to them as well. Mm -hmm. It's just how they're applying it, in my opinion. And so I just think it's really cool. And then obviously <laughs> lots of cool weapons and lots of like, swords and lots of cool things. So that's what appealed to me and still does. Thanks, Sensei Dofa. Sensei Suino? Well, I think my um, my earliest memory of ninjas, I think, would have been the James Cavell uh, Shogun movie, uh, the, the miniseries. Um, if I'm right, wasn't there some really cool ninjutsu stuff where they came into? So I just remember them climbing over the ramparts, throwing shuriken, and 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 it was purely visceral response. I was just like, this is the the coolest thing I've ever seen. Where do I sign up? <laughs> so I don't that. know when was that? Mid seventies, late seventies? It was uh, 1980. Was it okay? So I'd already been involved in martial arts for a little while at that time, but. Uh, 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 it just that's what brought ninjutsu to my to, to my brain, and uh, I, I didn't I didn't have to analyze it. It was just a pure visceral response. Well, and we'll go to your next Hanchi legacy. But you were in the Shogun miniseries, weren't you, Master Hayes? Yeah, yeah. I had several roles. Um, so I was a ship member, crew. You know, in the opening scenes, the ship is torn up in the storm and you know i'm climbing a rat line and i fall off and knock another guy and we drown and then uh i also was a stunt double for john reese davies who played the portuguese navigator yeah now you know back in those days i had a dark beard and you know long curly hair and uh 
you know, John Rhys Davies, he's a he's a very big guy, but he's got this very Shakespearean voice. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I'm supposed I'm supposed to imitate John, you know. And, uh, so they got me a water ski light vest that I would put on, and then they had duplicate costumes of John's costumes. I would put this costume on. I'd have to run down the ship in a storm and uh you know i didn't know they were going to just dub his voice in uh so i'm trying to speak like this Uh. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and uh so anyway so i'm doing this and then uh that rodriguez character gets washed off the ship and so that was me not john's Hmm. washed off the ship And then Richard Chamberlain dives into the stormy seas and rescues him. And, you know, I mean, that's as a plot device, you know, that just, okay, hey, that kind of binds them because they were mortal enemies, you know, Portuguese and English. And uh, 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 so I'm pretending to drown and Richard Chamberlain dives in. And uh, it was really funny because my costume, I had a water ski life vest on so i kept popping up out of the the water you know the water is like here at my waist and you know i'm trying to (laughs) and richard chamberlain had on this padded vest and shirt and it's waterlogged and he's going down (laughs) so i'm up here and I'm reaching down, grabbing him by the costume, pulling him up out of the water. And then, oh, God, God, this isn't working. This isn't working. And uh, so we finally figured out a way to uh, make me drown and him uh, pull me out. But it took a long time, a lot of filming and uh, a lot of funny stories like that. But What an awesome connection. Um, that was a very good John Reese davies impression, by the way. You've still <laughs> got your, you've still got, I remember him from Indiana Jones. Hanji Legacy, what about you? What, what fascinated you? I remember even in the early years of my time with you in the 90s, you talking about ninjas, and it was really appealing to me to know that you had that knowledge around karate, and then, uh, you know, what is it for you? I looked into that when I was younger myself, yeah. Well, I really think it's like human nature, curiosity anything deep and dark and mysterious. I could just throw a couple of things out you to make you uh, relate to what I'm saying. The Lone Ranger, Zorro, mm. they're a mask, they're not known, makes you more curious. You wanna know more. Uh, I think that's what it really was, just human nature and wanting to know more. And of course, being very exciting and interesting. Well, you know, uh, that brings up something very interesting because I'm a 1940s guy. I was born in the 40s. And so when I was a small child, you know, my heroes were Western mm. cowboys, specifically Hopalong Cassidy. You know, he wore, right. Yeah, he wore all black. And very oddly, he had a black hat that he wore back in the days when the black hats were the bad guys and white mm. hats were the good guys. And he was like a hero to me and he had this silver six shooters and but a hero back in those days would come in to a problem you know and he would help the people solve the problem uh, you know and at the end of the show he, he wouldn't take any reward or you know mm-hmm. he would just move on to the next situation mm-hmm. That's what a hero was to me as a small child. And uh, later, after Hopalong Cassidy retired, Zorro, you know, you mentioned Zorro. Absolutely. You know, I was like maybe 10 or 11 when Zorro came in. And again, he wore all black and he had this mask on and he had a silver sword. And uh, oh, I loved that. You know, I loved that. The hero, you know, he had this corrupt mega half business, half government running things in Southern California. And, uh, you know, the average person's trying to make their way through that. And Zorro would, you know, he would cut through and uh, he was a nobleman, but put that mask on and nobody knew who he was. He could come in and expose the corruption and, uh, uh, 
So I knew I couldn't be Hopalong Cassidy and I couldn't be Zorro. So I took the third black clad silver starred warrior. I moved to Japan and became a ninja. You know? uh, but when you think about today, what's a hero? Not 1950s style, not 1950s style. To the young people today, a hero is somebody with something wrong. And in spite of whatever's wrong with them, they manage to do something noble and helpful. Uh, you know, like the Christian Bale, Batman. I like mm -hmm. Batman. When I, mm -hmm. I like guys in black suits uh, <laughs> with masks, you know. Uh, so I liked Batman when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, Batman was this super wealthy guy who, again, saw the corruption in the government. And uh, so he put on a mask and a suit, and he went in to help fight crime in ways that, you know, the people working with the machine maybe couldn't have done. And uh, uh, so he's a wealthy guy. He could have just stayed in the house and enjoyed himself. But no, he risked this. Mm -hmm. Christian Bale, Christian Bale, Batman, he's mentally ill. He's mentally ill, you know, and he's broken down and the doc has to give him shots and, you know, things so he can move around. And, you know, he stays in his house for eight years under depression. Uh, that's modern hero. Uh, uh, I don't think we could do a movie or a TV series today with what's called a non-ironic hero. You know, just somebody who's just straight out. You know, I want to help. Uh, I've got some advantages. I'm going to put those to work. I, people wouldn't buy it. They, they'd laugh at it, you know. Uh, <laughs> too honest. <laughs> I think too honest. But, you know, the young ones, young ones, you know, that's not their culture anymore. That's not their culture anymore. Uh, yeah. Now, I will say this. They kind of earned their cynicism. Look how many politicians have been caught, you know, doing nefarious things. And oh God, remember back in the 90s, there were all those religious leaders that were like gang raping the secretary and having to pay her off to keep her quiet. And you know, athletes uh, you know, caught betting on games that they're not allowed. So, you know, one by one, our politicians, our movie stars, our athletes, uh, all these heroes have been exposed. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, and so sure. now people are, they feel cheated. You know, yeah. I think they feel cheated. Hey, I believed in you. I believed in you and you let me down and now I'm embarrassed. So our movies show these, you know, uh, wounded broken people who somehow managed to do something noble uh, well, one thing i love that you're doing is you're relating all these things we're talking about to the society from which they're coming and i think that's so important ladies and gentlemen if you're watching and you watch on a regular basis you realize how in-depth we've gone without even doing our intros because i just want to keep going down these lines of questioning but we want to know more about you master hayes so I'm going to stop right now and we'll just do some intros and a little bit of housekeeping. And we've got something new for everybody watching, which I'm really excited about. Um, but like I said, my name's Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. I'm here with Sensei Randy Dauphin, with Sensei Nicholas Suino, and with Hanchi Gary Legacy. And, you know, I was thinking about this. I did a bit of math on this. And, you know, there was that book that came out, The Outliers, that talks about 10,000 hours to mastery. And conservatively, I've been believe between the four of us we'd have well over a hundred thousand hours of time in in the dojo and on the mats and I, I, that, that's conservative so i just want to say what a pleasure it is to be among your company senseis and it's it's lovely to be here hosting the show with you sensei dofa i know you'd like to introduce our guest and we love to hear it i do like to and honestly we have some guests that it's really hard to find information on them and then we have master hayes who you got to start paraphrasing things because otherwise I would just be reading the introduction for an hour and a half. Mm. <laughs> so uh, Master Hayes, I always like to mention education. He's already talked about it. He's got a Bachelor of Arts degree from Miami University with a focus in speech and theater. Uh, no surprise based on the last conversations we were just having. 
Uh, he spent his entire adult life in the pursuit of perfection through the study of the Asian martial arts and spiritual traditions. This is kind of cool. He's lived and traveled throughout North America, Japan, Europe. Europe's not a country, by the way. That's And North America is not a country. These are continents, right? The Arctic, China, Tibet, Nepal, and India. A bunch of those are on my bucket list. Mm -hmm. uh, Sensei Hayes has traveled to Japan in the 1970s and began training under uh, Sunisa. Uh, I'm going to probably butcher this uh, sentence, so I apologize. Uh, Tsuena Mura. Did I say that even remotely close? Uh, yeah. So Tanemura, it was his family name, and Tsunehisa was his uh, first name. And I trained with him for a few years. Mm -hmm. That was in 1975 is when you first met yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, later, uh, you trained under Masaki Hatsumi, who uh, referred him to the 34th Grand Master of Togaka Togakura Ryu Ninjitsu and is the founder of the Bujin Khan organization. In 1985, Sensei Hayes was entered into the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame as Instructor of the Year. And then in March 2007 issue, the magazine featured Master Hayes on the cover and referred to him as one of the 10 most influential living martial artists in the world. Ooh, that's <laughs> yeah. real. Off the mats, Master Hayes is the author of many, many, many martial arts books, both fiction and nonfiction. And yeah, today I, I went and watched a lot of his 1988 action film, Ninja Vengeance. And I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> Made me feel young when I watched it. I felt, I felt young again. Um, <clears throat> as well, Master Hayes is uh, an ordained practitioner of the esoteric Tendai Mikyo Buddhism. Um, you know, I always like to give some personal uh, uh, comments. Um, I like that you went to university uh, said say because you thought there was a judo club there right i really like that that you your draw to uh higher education was actually martial arts um for me i said i was a bit nervous about doing this show because from my youth like all my images of a ninja and all that that draw and allure was master hayes like that's all the books the movies covers on magazines um and you know we've already heard a, an interesting thing. One thing I think about Master Hayes is this is a person who's really living a life, like really living a life, not, not pretending to live a life, meeting interesting people, following his passions, doing the things that he wants to do. Like how many people do we know that have, have met the Dalai Lama? Like mm -hmm. the only person I've ever met so far that's met the Dalai Lama. And so <laughs> I, I'm both nervous and excited, and this is already so enjoyable. And so uh, thank you, <laughs> Master Hayes, for coming on. Super proud to have you on our, our podcast, Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. Thanks, Sensei. Can I say that if, uh, uh, Sensei Hayes, if you could, if you have your books with you, that you could uh, show one or two of, to us, or you could mention the names of your books. Yeah, I don't have, I'm, I'm in my, this is my house dojo okay. and uh, uh, books are somewhere else in the house. Um, I have like 22 books and, uh, you know, book publishing has changed a lot in recent years. Um, not for the good, not for the good. Uh, with the advent of like, eBay and Amazon where you can resell old books it you know if somebody could buy one of my books for twelve dollars why would they pay 19 for it you know and so uh it's really affected the whole publishing industry uh so you know best thing is go on Amazon if somebody goes on Amazon and just type in Stephen S-T-E-P-H-E-N middle initial K Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, Stephen K Hayes under the little search bar, it'll bring up all my books. Um, and uh, you could 
you know, get them from uh, Amazon. I do have a couple of eBooks that are not uh, published as hard, actual grab a hold books. So you have to, Amazon, they don't bring those up. If you put in Stephen K. Hayes, uh, you have to put in under eBook, Stephen K. Hayes, right on. you know, and then I, I, oh, I, mean, I have a book of poems I wrote uh, years ago, but they relate to the martial art. And uh, I have a couple of uh, 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 not really martial art books. They're more of the spiritual aspect, but they're spiritual in relation to the martial arts. Why are we studying a martial art? If you know how to kill somebody, what are you doing with that? How do you make a decision? Um, you get into some kind of a street confrontation. Uh, where do you go? Uh, what is your motivation? Uh, how are you looking at this? Um, what's the significance of your life? You know, because I mean, a lot of the people watching this have devoted their whole life to uh, uh, martial arts. And uh, what does that mean? What does it mean? What have you learned? What have you gained in 20 years of study or 30 years of study? What have you gained? How are you a more advanced, more at home with yourself uh, person, uh, a bigger person, uh, someone that other people, they don't even know you're in the martial arts, but they kind of admire you. There's something about this guy. There's something about this lady. Uh, uh, we need to pay attention to them. Um, those kind of things uh, that are referred to. So that would be like maybe under Amazon ebook. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we really love to promote our guests and we want to make sure that everybody knows where to find your stuff. So that's awesome. Mm. Um, I'm just going to do a quick bit of housekeeping and then we're going to come back to your story from the beginning. Um, for everybody watching, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on the podcast, we're so glad you're here. Please hit that subscribe, like button. And as importantly, share word of mouth is everything for us. Uh, if you're with us here on the Zoom call, we've got the chat button at the bottom. We've already had some questions come in, but Jesse, who's running the behind the scenes tonight, he's going to light that up and just let you know where that button is. And then I want to tell you all about something awesome that's happening for us here at PKCC. We have a new sponsor on board, and this is excellent for us. We consider you and us in this together. And so as we've got this sponsor, we're really excited about your feedback. And we actually want you to go try this thing I'm about to tell you about. And then you might message us and go, yeah, we don't like your connection to that, or we love your connection to that, or this is the best product in the world, or this is this is whatever, because we're really excited to have this interactivity with you, even as far as this goes. So I'm going to tell you about a little something. It's called Bet Stamp app. Now, basically the deal is, is that normally when you go and you do some line betting, you want to go bet on the UFC, you want to go bet on a basketball game, whatever, you just go find some odds online and you do it. What Bet Stamp does is it actually gets all the online books in one place because they don't all offer the same odds. So one online site might offer different odds for a UFC fight from another one. And if you're going to place a bet on that fight, this app tells you where the best odds are. You want to go bet on the Leafs this weekend? What do you think, Sensei Dauphin? Is that a good idea? You, you, want to, you want to find where you can get the best odds for when you win. Um, so I just want to say that you want to check this out. You want to let us know what you think about this. And the free app can be downloaded wherever you download your apps. And be sure when you do it to use the referral code PKCC. Uh, and you want to go to the website betstamp.com. App. Let us know what you think, folks. We're really excited to have a partner, and if uh, if if we love them, it grows. And uh, I hope you do. I hope we do. Go try some bets. See what happens. If you uh, ever mention that hockey team on this podcast again, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> the Toronto Maple persona non grata. I love it. Um, Master Hayes, we're back to you now. What brought you into your first uh, dojo, club, training facility, and what kept you there? Well, as a small child, you know, I remember, oh, I was back in the early 50s, I remember, you know, going to school and, you know, some kids would be picking on other kids, bullying them or, or whatever, and I didn't like that. Uh, 
they didn't usually bully me, but they would bully other people. I didn't like it, but I didn't know what to do about it. I mean, you know, my family, they weren't fighters. Uh, um, uh, I didn't know what to do about it. And I remember I was like six and I saw there was a TV show in America called Lassie. It was about this farm boy who had this collie dog. And uh, so uh, in this one episode, there was a Japanese exchange student who came over to live with these farm people. And now this was only like 10 years after World War II. You know, it's kind of amazing. 10 years after World War II, and this Japanese exchange student comes over and he's very polite. And uh, some of the, you know, farm kids want to bully him and pick on him. And he just throws three or four of these kids all around with this, you know, judo and karate. And, God, you know, my spirit was you know, electrified, you know. Wow. And then later in the same show, the parent of one of the bullies, he's going to try to set fire to the Lassie family's barn. And Lassie comes out and grabs him by the arm and pulls him away. And so he's got his arm all torn up. And this little Japanese kid says, oh, I got something for that. And he runs back to his room and he comes and he has some kind of healing salve. And wow, you can tear somebody up or you can heal them. And it's it's up to you. Uh, oh, God, I got to learn this. But, you know, there were no schools around in those days. So for like 10 years, you know, I would hear these little fleeting references to martial arts. And uh, so finally, in the mid 60s, I was touring different colleges and uh, <laughs> I got told some people this story before but so the guy that was taking us around I saw this guy walking out walking in the gym in a gi and so I grabbed this guy and said who's that what's that and he says oh he's on the judo team judo I'm coming here I'm I made my mind up right away this is the place I'm gonna come and uh, so I went to Miami University and you know, I got there in the fall, and one of the first things I did was try to find this judo team. <laughs> no judo team. <laughs> they didn't have a judo team. <laughs> what? <laughs> the oh. ultimate bait and switch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's this guy? And well, I found out that the Navy, this is back in the Vietnam War days. And so they had a big ROTC. This is like, a, maybe a year or two before the hippie phenomena, you know, so there was a big ROTC thing. And then there was a Navy commander who had been in the Korean War and had studied Tang Sudo. And he had a Tang Sudo club for the midshipmen, the, you know, the students who were in the Navy. And I wasn't in the Navy. And, uh, oh, man, I did all kinds of finagling to get into that club. And they eventually let me join this Tang Sudo club. So I went there to learn judo, but, you know, Tang Sudo, I mean, back in the mid sixties, I didn't know really the difference. Uh, and uh, so I just ate that up. I ate that up. So real quick question. And we were talking about this beforehand and I don't want to spend too long on it, but we were talking about the idea that today I can just Google seven martial arts clubs. I can get reviews on Yelp. I can figure out their schedule without leaving the comfort of my home. It took you 10 years of a whisper campaign going to the wrong college to find a martial art that you had to convince the guy to let you in because you didn't qualify. Pros and cons of each. Oh, uh, well, you know, I've talked with several of my senior guys. We have this Toshi, what we call it Toshindo, as we call our, our martial art now. And I've got some guys that have been with me since the 80s. And, uh, you know, they're pushing 70, uh, but they're tough guys, tough guys. And, you know, I said, you know, what do you remember from like starting martial arts? Oh, man, I remember uh, like 
there were legendary, you know, nobody had seen martial arts, but uh, we knew it was the answer. And every one of them, you know, had the same thing where, oh, you know, I, I tried to uh, be cool around the teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to throw me out. Uh, and, uh, and, and I want them to teach me, maybe they teach me some fakey stuff or, you know, they don't believe in me or whatever, and I'm not going to know the difference. Uh, so I want to know the real stuff. And it really created a super dedication, uh, mm. you know, and I would go to the library and try to find books, and, you know, a couple little books, and then I would try to study the philosophy behind this. So that's kind of where I got involved with Asian spiritual systems. And uh, now, oh man, every strip mall has a dojo. And um, two things with the modern situation. Um, this friend that I was talking to, uh, you know, he's he runs our school in Tampa, Florida. And uh, he was saying to me, it's quite shocking, quite shocking. He says, well, you know, there's kind of a undercurrent among kids that martial arts, that's for the dweebs that can't make it on the team. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, you know. Uh -huh. Well, I remember, oh man, to get into a martial arts school and then to train. I remember actually training with criminals. You know, this one guy had a dope running thing that he was selling dope, and another guy would get girls for guys. But you know, I came from kind of a suburban, you know, squeaky clean background. I figure if I can hold my own against these guys, huh? criminals, I must be doing okay. And uh, um, you know, now. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. You know, now, there is the hardcore MMA schools. There's one nearby us. It's really hardcore. You know, and they're preparing people for the UFC and these different things. And uh, new people come in and they just kind of use them mm -hmm. as, as, you know, we call cannon fodder or something like that. And, you know, I don't, uh, that's not really being honest, but they are, they say, Hey, we're training and you can train with us. So they are being honest now, sure. something, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, that this is just something for the little dweeby kids that can't make it on the team. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's the waves, eh? What's that? Just the waves of the different years. And yeah, the yeah, years. Culture, culture changing, culture yeah. changing. And, uh, I uh, I get it that a lot of people now are like parents. You know, they, they get their kids involved. And uh, all the years I had a dojo, I never had a parent say to me, okay, now I want to just check you out. Uh, if my kid gets into a push and shove, I want him to be able to like break the nose of the other kid. Can you teach him that? nobody ever asked me anything like that it was well you know he needs a little confidence or uh, oh he's got anger issues or uh, i want him to get discipline you know and a lot of times what i knew the parent was saying is i want my kid to obey me when i tell him to do something right <laughs> <laughs> oh god you know so i, I get him for you know, two hours a week, and I'm going to turn him into the model child. You get him all the rest of the days, and you're doing all the, you know, mediocre <laughs> job of parenting. Um, very, very difficult. Most parents, you know, I, I look, I want him to be confident, but I don't want him to be a bully. I don't want him to be a bully. I don't want him to get into fights. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so now there is a group of people. I have to be careful how I say this, but uh, let me put it this way. When I first started the martial arts in the mid sixties, these were Navy guys who'd all been to war. 
you know, these, these were tough guys, but they didn't like act tough. Did you follow me? I mean, they yeah, 100%. were tough guys. I mean, if you push one of these guys around, oh man, you got a wildcat on your head. But, you know, he was, they, they enjoyed themselves, you yeah. know, and if, if push came to shove, oh man, they would have been, you know, I mean, these were tough guys. And uh, I was constantly questioning myself, you know, hey, am I tough enough to hang in here with these guys? You know, I've never been to war. I never killed a person. Um, now, you know, there are a lot of uh, martial art teachers who uh, um, may not be that tough. You know, they, they, they may not... Uh, have created their ability you know i see on some of these magazines you know they look like young moms you know a little young mom and she's got like stripes on her black belt and uh uh she's teaching different things to the kids now i think uh more in conjunction with what parents are looking for uh then, uh, hey, man, you, you get these, this guy's got you in a corner, you're down on your butt, he's kicking you in the head, how are you going to get out of that? We never do things like that, you know? Um, uh, yeah, in this day and age, um, when people get in fights, it's not one-on-one, -on -one. Mm. it's four-on-one. And that is totally acceptable. Now, back in the early 80s, if I had proposed taking four more guys and going after one guy, oh, you're a coward. That's, that's dishonorable. Not anymore. Not anymore. You can watch YouTube videos all night. They swarm. Uh, and that's, uh, I watched this old British movie and there's an old guy, you know, and he was a real tough guy when he was young. And he comes down into this, gang of people and he's talking i could take you i could take you and they look at each other and they just swarm him you know and he's screaming hey this isn't fair and this one you know young cocky kid says hey that's the way we do it now pops uh -huh. that's the way we do it now and so how are you teaching these kids to deal with a swarm um oh no, we're going back and forth, back and forth with another training partner or hitting the bag or whatever. Uh, whoa, man, you may not even see to hit the bag. How are you going to deal with that? And, and the mind is overwhelmed. Your mind is overwhelmed. What are you doing to prepare these kids, you know, to sink back into centeredness? And uh, uh, so we don't deal with that. Uh, that's not what the parents are looking for. And if we did that with the kids, I, I think that a lot of parents would, uh, you know, would, would be afraid of that. Uh, anyway, that's my opinionated opinion. And I, I, I know maybe somebody watching this could be offended by that. And, uh, you know, I, I can just say, well, you know, I'm a 1940s guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I was brought up. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of a dinosaur. Uh, don't know that I totally fit the modern culture. You'd need somebody else. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, that's really the way I, I see it. So that's a long-winded answer to your, your question. How it's different. Is it better is it worse uh i don't know you know and nowadays somebody gets in a push around or a fight immediately you know yeah phones come out hey, well, i'm gonna record this uh you know and then they can edit the recording so that only the incriminating part is in there um but we're raising a generation of people who are not going to jump in and help they're going to get their phone out and record it uh wow so i go back to being a five-year-old no i wanted to help i wanted to help this guy is is being overwhelmed uh he's pleading hey stop it man stop it take it hey come on 
I wanted to be able to stop it. I want to make there be peace if it's gone into chaos. That's what motivated me. Uh, young one today, I don't know. Do they identify with that at all? Uh, I have to leave that question mm -hmm. open. Well, let's, uh, let's leave 10 questions open until you answer them, because it is time, as it is in all of our shows around this time, for our 10 questions. So we ask that you answer as impulsively as you can, expand if you wish, but we want to get your first impulse. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Fish hook. Just go right in there drag your thumbnail along the gum line and get a hold of his face, make him look where you want, and then shoot out to the neck. <laughs> Love it. What is the, who, who is the most influential martial artist in your life? Um, probably Morihei Uyeshiba. I'm not an Aikido guy. I've never studied Aikido, but I love these stories of this Uyeshiba, you know, I mean, when he was young, he was tough. He almost got killed in uh, Mongolia as a spy. Uh, and then somewhere in his 50s, he was hit with this spiritual vision of what martial arts were supposed to be. This was after World War II and the Japanese government twisted things and people believed this stuff. And, uh, so he became a, a, a spiritual uh, advocate. So yeah, I'd say this Morihei Uyeshiba. So that might lead to our next question. Who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Oh man, I would say just uh, probably the guy of legends, Miyamoto Musashi, you know, who just grew up angry as a kid. He was just angry and his dad knocked him around and uh, he just dedicated himself to the sword. Uh, and, you know, he would like take on big groups of people. He'd have to cheat. He'd have to cheat. And, uh, but he, he won. He won a couple of times he lost. So he'd go study what it was. And, uh, and then by the time he was an old guy, you know, he retired to a cave very near where my wife's family home is. And so we've been to this cave. The cave still exists, Musashi's cave. And uh, wrote or dictated the book of five rings, these five elements and things to think about. Uh, I've read the Book of Five Rings several times and I got a little bit out of it. A lot of it's very confusing. A lot of it's very confusing, but I think that life story uh, would make Miyamoto Musashi my idea of kind of the ultimate martial artist. Uh, what excites you most about the next five years of your training? Well, I just retired last year and uh, it's been liberating. Uh, now, I'm still like the granddaddy figure of our Toshindo martial art. You know, I mean, my wife and I travel. So we're going to go next month down to Chapel Hill. We have a large school down there and we'll teach. She teaches a small Japanese woman's version and I teach a middle sized American version and uh uh, that's exciting to see how many women we have training with us. Uh, uh, this is, it's not a strength based martial art. It's, uh, it, it fits women very well. And so I do private lessons here in this dojo and I do zoom private lessons and I'm working on a book that just really focuses in on these, what I call the five elements uh, but how they actually show up in, in real life in conf verbal conflict. And, uh, you know, everybody's got that one jerk at work. Uh, how do you deal with this guy? And uh, it's kind of these secrets. So uh, all of that is coming together and uh, uh, really excited about the next five years.
I love it. You sound about as retired as a martial artist can get. You're writing a book, you're teaching Zoom classes, in-person classes, and teaching seminars. That sounds about like the retirement that I would imagine for you. <laughs> um, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Uh, what was that? If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Hmm. Uh, welcome home. <laughs> Do you have a favorite film and television martial artist? Oh, you know, I, uh, it's embarrassing to admit, but I really haven't seen that many martial art movies. Uh, I don't know. I'm a kind of a fan of Jet Li. Mm. Uh, and his whole story, you know. I've seen several Jet Li movies. I really like Jet Li and uh, Michelle Yeoh. Uh, she's amazing, you know. I mean, she's not really young, but she's still doing stuff. And uh, I met her one time at uh, uh, there were like the Academy Awards thing. I was in in this hotel where she was, and uh, uh, she was very. Uh, just a really wonderful person. Yeah. So maybe Michelle Yo and uh, Jet Li. I like Jet Li. Right on. Um, is there a martial artist in all of recorded history, living or dead, that you wish you could train with? Well, maybe um, my teacher's teacher. So this was Toshitsugu Takamatsu. Takamatsu is the family name and Toshitsugu. Now he died a year and a half before I got to Japan in 1975, but he was an 1800s guy ranging around China when Japan was, you know, there and uh, um, had run-ins with the Japanese mafia. Uh, and uh, I think it would be really interesting to see his version of, the martial art that we are teaching today mm -hmm. in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Uh, if everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you got from martial arts, whether they train or not, what benefit would they be getting? Peace of mind, peace of mind and uh, a joy for life. Mm -hmm. And I attribute that to the martial arts as a kid. I was very different. You know, I had a, uh, temper you know that probably came from fear uh you know people who are fearful cover over it with anger and uh um didn't know what i wanted to do i was a weird kid um and uh but once i found the martial arts and this eastern spiritual thing those two things i was home i was home and so i so i say at 73, you know, I've never worked a day in my life. And I've always gotten to do my childhood dreams. Maybe. So maybe everybody could have that. Uh, our last two questions come as a pair. Greatest achievement and greatest regret. Oh, greatest achievement. Oh, uh, yeah, maybe going to Japan and talking my way into this ninja school and not letting them run me out. And uh, I got what I wanted. I got what I wanted. And uh, greatest regret? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I think uh, maybe I should have started a martial arts school sooner. So through the 80s and into the 90s, I was like the ninja guy, you know, and uh, I actually didn't have a job and I didn't have a dojo. The books, believe it or not, they sold so well that I could live off of those book royalties and my wife and I would travel to Japan and train and uh, I could. Uh, so I didn't think I wanted to run a dojo. And then somewhere in the mid nineties, late nineties, uh, we decided to start a dojo. So maybe I regret not taking that dojo more seriously uh, sooner in my life. You know, I look around at some guys now and they have, 
you know, big dojos with lots of seventh and eighth degree black belts and oh, I'm a little jealous. I'm a little jealous. You know, they started in and they built this up and uh, they found people they could trust to help them run it. And uh, there's a guy in uh, Denver uh, who has an Aikido school. It's a, I've been there. It's beautiful. Aikido school. But he also has a Japanese restaurant connected to it. And the third thing he has is a Japanese gift shop. And oh, God, you know, my wife and I say, that's what we should have done. You know, that's what we should have done. Too late. <laughs> Too late now. But uh, yeah, so maybe that's my regret. Right. <laughs> those are really sort of fun regrets. Like I kind of like the way you put those. Um, we've got three questions that came in, but I've got one more that, you know, we want to ask you here is, what brought you to your first like ninja teacher? How did you find them? And what brought you to wanting that? Well, when I was in high school, I read a James Bond novel, uh, You Only Live Twice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, so I read the novel. Uh, I think there was a James Bond, like Dr. No or something like that, but I was too young to go see it. And I, you know, it, it came and went. So the novels, though, were really fascinating. And in this uh, James Bond novel, uh, James Bond, who's the protector of the monarch, and uh, he's sent to Japan, where he studies, it said in there, with the Iga and Togakure ninja. And uh, uh, so he studies this ninja, and to help him develop a cover, they get this gorgeous girl from the seacoast of Kyushu Island and he marries her and oh god mm -hmm. you know for a boring little 15 year old kid from Ohio you know this is just too much <laughs> and uh, that stayed with me that stayed with me and uh, I'll, I'll tell you something funny so many years later like somewhere in the 90s I realized hey I went to Japan and studied with the Iga and the Togakure. I did that. And uh, uh, um, the security escort for the Dalai Lama, you know, the king of Tibet, or he would be the king of Tibet if the Chinese hadn't have invaded. Uh, you know, so I'm protecting the monarch. And uh, I married what I thought of as a beautiful girl from a seacoast village on Kyushu Island uh so I <laughs> without even planning it you know I kind of lived out my childhood uh fantasy but that's where I first discovered these that's neat, amazing and oh man that was it, the way they described it in the book it they used weapons they used their mind they could sneak around and uh uh so I was sold I was sold and how'd you find your first teacher well, um, Black Belt Magazine did a series of articles uh, written by uh, uh, an American uh, reporter, Andy Adams. Uh, he worked for Japan Times, and he mostly covered sumo, but he, he got this ninja bug, and he actually wrote a book about ninja, and I got that book, and uh, I read Andy's articles, and it referred to this Hatsumi and uh this is real you can still study this and uh i was still studying tang sudo and you know pouting that i'd been born on the wrong side of the pacific ocean and you know uh but i think about 10 years so like 1975 so i started 65 1975 i just couldn't stand it anymore i've got to now, this is before the internet or email or anything like, that, you know, and I, I, I've got to go to Japan. I've got to find, you know, this ninja guy. And uh, it's crazy, just crazy. You know, I was 25 years old, so I got an airplane ticket to Japan and uh, got off in Tokyo. I had no idea where to go and just miracles happened miracles happened and it just took me to uh this uh this teacher you know it was really funny so i 
I'm, I found the town and I'm staying this little inn. They didn't have hotels back in those days. They had what are called ryokan. And a ryokan is like a B and B, like a bed and breakfast today. And uh, so I'm staying there and this little lady comes in and she's like, we don't have foreigners in Nota City. What are you doing here? And I said, oh. so oh, I came to study ninjutsu. <laughs> what <laughs> what yeah you know, be like running into a japanese somewhere you know in america today and so why are you here and he says i came to study with batman oh god <laughs> oh just made batman up it's not a real guy and uh so she said oh, there's no ninja in Nota city and i said well you know there is there's this guy named uh <clears throat> Hatsumi and uh, and she goes well. No, Hatsumi is a, a therapist. Uh, he's not a ninja. And I'd read in the book that's what this guy did for a living. You know, so, that's the one. That's the one. And then she says, "No, he's not a ninja. I am a childhood friend of his mother. We've known each other our whole life. We have lunch together once a week. He's not a ninja." And so he had not told anybody. He was still studying. He hadn't told anybody. And she said, do you want me to call him up? But, <laughs> I couldn't look his name up in a phone book. That's oh, there's kanji. And she called him up. He came over that night. And, uh, and I started training the next day. <laughs> you know, which is right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was just amazed. They accepted me right away. I mean, I was, I wore a suit and tie, you know, for my interview. And I thought I'd have to give them letters and all that. Ah, you don't need that stuff. Just you can train with this tiny Mora guy. And uh, uh, <laughs> years later, there was another man <clears throat> who's one of my favorite guys. You know, he's about my, we were in our 20s when we started. And uh, he ended up like a colonel in the Japanese army. And my wife is talking to this, this uh, Colonel Monaco. She says, oh, yes, Stephen was quite honored, you know, that you guys would accept him like right away and he could start training. And this <laughs> Colonel Monaco says, cocks his head and goes, oh, is that what he thought happened? And she goes, whoa, what? <laughs> what? And he goes, oh, no. Um, for our age and our generation, Stephen's a big guy, you know? And so Hatsumi Sensei said, uh, hey, let's invite him to the dojo. We'll try out our techniques on this big guy. And after about five days, he's going to think we're crazy and he's, he'll go away and we can go back to training. And I just never left. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh God, this stuff is awful. Oh God, it's awful. But man, this is what I want. I'd never seen anything like this. In the States in the 60s, I'd not seen anything like that. And and they dealt with weapons. And so I was so used to to learn the sword. You go to a sword school, you know, and uh, you know, to learn uh, nunchaku, you go to an Okinawan karate and uh, uh all these, you know, to learn grappling, you go to a judo school mm -hmm. and to go capture energy, you have to go to an aikido school. And this martial art is so old. That it predated, like in the what they call the Meiji era. You know, it started about the time of our civil war. Japan had a big civil war then too, and they overthrew the shogun and the samurai, and they brought the emperor back. And it was really the military-industrial complex that was running Japan, but they used the emperor. And so, late eighteen hundreds. Um, that's when the specialization started, where mm. Jigo Okano developed, you know, his jujitsu into judo and uh, uh, maybe just the, a sword, sword school. And uh, but this art was so old that it, it just all jumbled in together. So we would learn grappling and then, you know, pull out a blade or we... The, the sword work is, was very different from uh, kendo. Uh, the, uh, um, 
you know, my understanding of kendo is, you know, we're squared up and we're moving very quickly with the hands, but this method we use, it uses the whole body. So we start out real sideways and uh, come in because everybody's trying to keep distance. And so to make up that distance, oh, oh God, this is so different from anything that I'd studied before. And, uh, you know, the grappling, it, it was, it was pretty heavy duty, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. so there was a uh, receiving range and then a close in range and then just how to crinkle the guy up and get him on the ground and kill him. Uh, this is the historical ninja martial art. And, uh, and then there were other techniques that were just how to escape. Guys got your arm locked up and twisted around here. How to escape, how to go with that rather than fight it and get out of there. Because these people were intelligence gatherers. So they, didn't, they were not going to stick around and fight. They had to get, you know, a samurai grabs them or something. They have to escape and just get out of there, you know, where their cover is blown or this kind of thing. And oh man so this isn't your question but by the mid 90s you know i started to tweak this we keep the principles the same but i wanted something that really fit the american scene the way troublemakers start a fight in america is very different than 1500s japan and uh, uh, the, the clothing that people wear. And uh, so we keep the principles, but, you know, we even have, ver we even have verbal kata, verbal kata. You know, some guy hits you with this. You've got to practice. You've got to be ready. You know, some wise guy hits you with some put down. Your brain go, well, I, I got to say something cool back. And while your brain is going on there, you just knock you out or whatever. And so we have these elements, the earth and fire, the different elements have a different kind of response and just let people practice that. Just let them mm -hmm. practice that so that, uh, especially in this day and age, you know, you're going to be recorded. And if you're not recorded here, there's some kind of a big brother thing, you know, outside the store or whatever, uh, uh, recording you. And uh, uh, now in the U.S., I don't know about Canada, but in the U.S., there are a few states <clears throat> that have changed this. But the majority of states, you have to prove that what you did was self-defense. Sure. Oh, no, I'm the good guy. And he attacked me and uh, uh, mm, got to prove it. Prove it. Well, you know, uh, and, and oh, man, they're tricky. They're tricky. Uh, I believe government doesn't want us, you know, being self-reliant. I say that with a chuckle, you know, uh, but no, you go to court, you know, and there's a jury of your peers you studied some kind of ninja killing art. <laughs> I think you just took on them four guys to try out your stuff. You know, um, it's crazy today. So we added all that stuff, the laws in there and verbal stuff. And then the way we move and uh, even there are, even in the old ninja method, there are, we, we call them, these are uh, called kamae, but it's like fighting postures and they obscure the face. I can see everything that's happening, but this person can't see my face because mm -hmm. in the old days, maybe a guy could hang onto his cover a little bit longer, you know, this way, oh, oh you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to fight, uh, you know, and then, but we can see through there mm -hmm. or, Tate no kamae, shield position this way. I can see, but they can't. We brought those back uh, uh, today. 
uh, maybe you could obscure yourself a little bit uh, from a camera or, or whatever. And uh, uh, so it's interesting time. Mm -hmm. Interesting time. So let's see if we can do three questions in under 10 minutes, because sadly, time is real. But you touched upon weapons. And uh, Sensei Justin Shea, one of our black belts in Legacy Shornru, wants to know what your take is on the history of the ninjato. He says there seems to be a lot of conflicting opinions on that weapon and its origins, and he'd love what you consider to be the facts. Yeah, well, um, if a person carried a specifically designed ninja sword, you know, if he was captured, oh, you're a ninja. Uh, mm. So um, what uh, was normally done was uh, they'd have a regular size scabbard and uh, uh, I can grab one real fast here. They would have a regular size scabbard, but the, the sword itself was shorter. Uh, and uh, so that would facilitate fighting inside, you know, not a battlefield, but inside a, a cramped place. And so, you know, when I wrote my first books, I had to make the decision. I said this earlier, do I go with the stereotype or do I try to, you know, talk about the complexities and, uh, and so forth? And so when I wrote my first books, I just went with a stereotype. This is the ninja sword, uh, as it's known, you know, be like talking about American Indians. Oh, this is the headdress that's known. Well, yeah, but the Iroquois only wore one feather here. Oh, come on, you know. Uh, so is there a ninja sword? If you're going with a stereotype, yes. Uh, is there, did every ninja carry a ninja sword? No. I am Siri, but enough about me. Thanks, Siri. <laughs> that was kind of awesome. Um, uh, so this one, again, I hate the times real, but how did the meeting with the Dalai Lama come about? From Mark Altamari. Well, I... Uh, uh, found it... Uh, uh, it's a long, long story, and I'm trying to make it real short here. Long, long story. Oh, so I ended up visiting Tibet in 1985 and 1986. When I came out of Tibet, I was in Tibet for about a month in 1986. And uh, again, no internet or email or anything like that. Um, I had a one year, a one month old baby at home and somehow my wife and her sister that she lived with us to help raise our kids, let me go and disappear into Tibet because I just needed to do this. And uh, so when I came out of Tibet, uh, I was visiting the little town where the Dalai Lama lived and, you know, I'm just being squirrely, you know, I say, Hey, can I meet the Dalai Lama? You know, and they said, uh, Oh, um, he's leaving today for New Delhi because he's going to have to fly away. So you'd have to go to New Delhi and, you know, meet him at his hotel. I said, I can do that. I can do that. I mean, I could meet him. Yeah, you know, and uh, so they knew I was a book writer. So maybe they thought I would write a book about the Tibetan situation or something like that. So I got to New Delhi and... I got to the hotel and, oh God, the place was just swarmed with cops and, uh, you know, Indian uh, people. And I said, well, oh, gosh, you know, I wouldn't think the Dalai Lama would have this many bodyguards. And so, oh, no, some are the Dalai Lama's bodyguards, but the others are Mr. Gandhi's bodyguards. <laughs> Rajiv Gandhi was meeting with the Dalai Lama. And then when he's done, I'm going to go in. Oh God, you know, I'm just this nobody crazy martial artist from Ohio. And uh, so I went in and met him and talked with him for a couple of hours. And they said, well, you know, he has to go to the airport. And back in those days, airplanes took off at night because the runway would get so hot that the tires mm -hmm. 
would melt. And so he was going to go to the airport and uh, uh, he was flying to Assisi to meet the Pope. So I'm wedged in between Rajiv Gandhi and the Pope, you know. <laughs> and uh, so one of the things I found out was he had a brother, his older brother, who had uh, betrayed the Chinese and went and warned the Dalai Lama, no, this is what the Chinese are going to do. This is back in the 1950s. This is what they're doing. They say this, but here's what they're doing. And now he was a wanted man. And so he lived in Indiana, very close to my home. And uh, so I met him and the Dalai Lama came to see him. And we had a big, huge turnout. And uh, I was uh, able to help with the security. And uh, so the, I just, for about 12 years, I would be the security escort in uh, North America when he came in. Uh, That's amazing. And I also love that the answer to the question is, I just didn't say no, right? Like, <laughs> you want to do this in New Delhi? Yes. You want to, like, <laughs> you know, like that's, that's the, sh that's so wonderful because there's so many, we talk a lot on this show about obstacles and, you know, you're talking a lot about the pre-internet time. Sensei Dolphin and I are the youngest two on this call. And we started before the internet as well. And um, I think a lot of people on the call might not be able to relate to the fact that if you wanted it, you had to go find it. And if they weren't there that day, there was no way of reaching them or whatever. Um, here's a question from Vitsir Fatehi. I hope I'm saying that right. Have you read the, the Tales of a Tory trilogy by Leanne Hearn, by Leanne Hearn? I'm sorry, the what? Have you read the Tales of the Atori trilogy? No, I don't know that. Oh, okay, because the question was how close it is to the reality of feudal Japan. Um, so thanks for your question. It's just not something he's touched upon. Um, I think, as you know, on the show, we do something called Going Around the Horn when we near the end. And so what's going to happen is we're all going to talk a little bit about our time with you tonight, but you're going to have the last word after all that, Master Hayes. Um, Hanshi Legacy, what do you want to say about our time tonight with, with Master Stephen Hayes? That was a great time. I, I would like to say that I agree with you when you originally said that um, the parents don't want you to teach their children to actually face violence. But how else? That's what we're put there. It's our duty. doesn't matter what the parent thinks. Our duty is to the martial art. And, and I agree with you. Uh, I'm not going to make this long, but uh, these guys can attest that when I have my black belt gratings, that they fight one person several times, like many single fights, um, have them fight two people, and then I put maybe five or six of them in there, and no one is on anybody's side, and just mm -hmm. to see how they react to swarming, and uh, I really agree with you on all those things. I'm from your era as well. <laughs> okay. And um, you touched on spirituality. How do you live spirituality with uh, willing having to break somebody's arm or kill somebody? Or, well, in the martial arts, you know, when you get into fights, you maybe get into four or five fights in your entire life that last five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, right? Whereas the rest of the time, your life is on a spiritual side. You're, you're doing what you want to do most of the time, and you're forced into doing violence and other stuff by somebody else's ignorance. So uh, you spent your, your time wisely in your martial art. Thank you for being here. And it was great to meet you. Great talking with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino? Uh, Master Hayes, thank you so much uh, for coming on Punch Kick Joke Chat. I um, grew up watching Lassie, so I think you may be <laughs> the first person to mention Lassie on our show. Um, and a couple of other firsts. Uh, when we asked the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal, you mentioned Fishhook. I don't think anybody's ever said that before and i may be mistaken but i'm pretty sure nobody's mentioned uh ueshiba sensei uh as one of the most influential martial artists of all time and i love the transition you talked about um 
what I've read of uh, Ueshiba Sensei was uh, about that idea of him going from a young uh, pugilist, as it were, to to a spiritualist, and the things that happened to him in Manchuria and so forth uh, were really formative. And it's a great arc that I think most serious lifetime martial artists experience, right? Is we are young, we want to fight, maybe we get good at fighting, and then hopefully as we get older, we start occupying the role of uh, a spiritual leader and uh, helping our society improve. Uh, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, as I start to climb the foothills of senility, I find myself more inclined uh, to help than to hurt. And I hear that uh, in everything you say and the things that I, that I read about you. Uh, Thank you again, and uh, I can't wait to occupy some space and uh, train together at some point. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dofa? I read a bunch of notes, uh, Master His. So I just, I'd really like at some point to be able to talk to you more about the Dalai Lama. I know those are probably big stories, and but, um, you know, his calendar is over there on my desk, and when the students come in, Sensei Legacy gave, always gives me a Dalai Lama calendar at christmas time and oh, when yeah. students come in they always go over to the desk and read whatever the message is from the dalai lama each day so i i like that i like the stuff about the myths of the ninja i like how you describe them i still like the way i romanticize them but i <laughs> i like i like the way you describe them realistically um like sets of legacy i like that you like dusters you like westerns uh if you go to Sense Legacy's house on a Sunday, you'll find him there watching Dusters. And I think you two would talk a lot about these, uh, the different shows that you enjoy. Um, on a more serious note, I really like that at a young age, uh, you kind of were a protector, right? You were seeing other kids getting bullied. And that was one of the things that drew you into martial arts. Um, some lots of people on our show have said Legend of Billy Jack or Enter the Dragon. You're the first one to say Lassie brought you into uh, <laughs> into the dojo. But, you know, the thing that you said also on a serious note is you said you thought it was cool that there was a character that could tear somebody up or also heal them. Right. That's not everybody comes, not everybody, but most people come to the dojo because they want to be able to tear somebody up. And that lesson comes later for them. But it seems like it was ingrained in you right from the beginning. Now, on the other side of it is, I got to admit, a fish hook and a shooto is going to end most of the fights. Like if you, you cannot argue that that's an effective move. If you fish hook and shooto somebody, the fight's probably going to be done. Um, I love Miyamoto Musashi, so I'm happy that you mentioned him as the most influential martial artist. Um, like Sense of Legacy, you said... You hoped God would say, you're welcome here. Let's say Legacy said, you hope God said, welcome, right? Like, just welcome here. Um, peace of mind and joy of life, greatest benefits. That's great. It's pretty rare to find somebody in the world who could live off of their book royalties. And it's pretty <laughs> cool that you were able to do that. Um, I'd say that that's almost an impossibility now, unless you have something else backing it up. But um, uh it's kind of cool that when you went to find the ninjutsu school, the person who knew them didn't think they were even a ninja. <laughs> kind of, kind of backs up the fact that he was a ninja, wasn't he? Right? Right. The people who knew him <laughs> That's right. Didn't even know he was a ninja. Um, I thought it was kind of funny too when you said you were big and they just thought you'd be a punching bag and you were like, "This is so cool. I'm staying forever." Um, <laughs> um, uh, Again, like what Sean said, I think it's cool that when they said, well, you can meet the Dalai Lama, but he's leaving and you got to go to New Delhi. And you were like, fine, I'm going to go to New Delhi and I'm going to meet the Dalai Lama. Um, yeah, and I just, it's been very enjoyable, very educational. And uh, like Sensei Suino, I know you're just in Ohio, which is not that far. I've passed, I've probably driven through your city like 20 times in my life. Wow. So, it would be really great to somehow be able to connect at some point and just have a coffee, exchange some ideas. Yeah. Stop, stop in if you're ever driving through. Thank you, Master Hayes. And thank you for tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Sensei Dofa. Um, there's a couple of things I want to touch on. You know, I, when I host, I get to guide it a little and ask my questions along the way. But you said just, you know, temper from fear. 
you had this temper from fear when you were younger. And I really connected with that. I think a lot of my temper was from fear, not even necessarily physical fear, just fear things weren't going to work out. Yes. Fear to control yes. the future fear. Of, and, and I was always so mad. And you said you were a weird kid. So was I, I'm not sure uh, uh, that's changed, but you know, martial arts was something that gave me a place where I could either be less weird or be accepted for the weirdness I was. And the idea that you were always like, you're training with these tougher men and you weren't sure you could hang, you know, you kept questioning yourself in the sixties, like, can I hang? And that was my experience too. And I really connected when you talked about that, it was just like, I'll come back again tomorrow and I'll see if I can hang. I'll come back again tomorrow. And the last thing I want to say, I touched about this in the chat, you know, you can't really understand a Shakespeare play unless you know the historical context in which it was written. You can't really understand, you know, why science was developed a certain way for the military in the 1930s if you don't know the historical context. And I just love how much historical context you brought to why the ninja were the way they were, because without knowing the bed on which they were, you know, jumping or sleeping or whatever, it it doesn't make a lot of sense. So when you put it in those frameworks, I, I just really appreciated that uh, from our chat. Um, the last word before we do some housekeeping after goes to you, Master. Oh, uh, hey, I've had a wonderful time. Uh, delighted that you would invite me to come in and share some stories. And, uh, you know, what I think would be fun. I don't know if there's, you know, people can leave comments or whatever, but it'd be interesting to hear from younger people who are studying, how does this old guy's vision, how does this fit with the younger view? Uh, did anybody get anything of value uh, from this? Does anybody have anything uh, I wanna argue with a little bit? You know, I'm up for that too. Uh, so maybe that would be fun to uh, uh, see what kind of follow-up comes from this. But I so appreciate all of you gentlemen uh, inviting me. I'm not a karate guy, but, uh, uh, enjoyed uh, speaking with all of you and reviewing some of the stuff I said I'd sort of forgotten. Uh, <laughs> you brought that out in me. So my thanks to you for this evening. Well, such a pleasure. Um, I'm going to throw it to Sensei Dauphin to talk about some upcoming stuff. And then uh, I'll say some thanks and our good night. Sensei Dauphin? Yeah, so next month, uh, February 2nd, February 9th, and February 23rd, we have shows with uh, Paul Bonner, Jamie Seabrook, and Chris Hansen. Um, they're various martial artists. With The first one we're going to talk to is Paul Bonner. He's a use of force instructor at the Ontario Police College. So I think he's going to bring some real world conversation to us. Um, yeah, that's what's coming up, Sean. I'm excited about it. I'm happy that we're, we're starting to book out farther and farther now. And uh, yeah. Super exciting. And we, you know, next week we're off as a, as a live show, but we're dropping one of our shorts as well. So please go check out punchkickchokechat.com because uh, not only are we super proud of our new website, but at the same time, that's where you can get all the information about all the stuff. And I just want to say thank you to Andre Sadashev, Justin Shea, Alden Adair, Jesse Vlevita, who ran our show behind the scenes for us tonight, Robert Schlumsky and Daniel Holland III. We don't have a show without them uh, behind the scenes, creating the buzz, creating the Instagram page, creating our our platform when we're running the show, letting you all in. So we're so grateful to them and we're so grateful to you again. And, and I'm so grateful to my, my teachers and, and, and martial arts batters for letting me host with them. Master Hayes, it's been a pleasure. And I just want to say thanks, Sensei, and thanks for everyone watching. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night.